Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Last time we ended up at uh, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3 and verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. We went over that. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Uh, we went over some things concerning that uh, particular... It says he has set the world in their hearts. And uh, what he means by that is, when the Lord created man, he birthed in the soul of man the awareness and existence of life beyond death. Man was made aware of eternity and that there was something more. Before I got saved, I knew there was something more in life. I didn't know what it was because nobody really had uh, witnessed to me yet as far as a real clear-cut plan of salvation. Man was made aware of eternity and that there was something more. This is seen in this phrase, God, he has set the world in their heart. He set, he gave. He put the world in man's heart. The word world here means everlasting, eternity, continuous existence. When the Lord made us, he made us eternal beings. He put eternity in our hearts. Mankind has been given understanding that there is something beyond his death. We have a curiosity about the future and what is, and what is going to happen tomorrow. We know there is something else down the road beyond the grave. The future, <clears throat> the future is why folks, including the unsaved, a lot of times have an interest in Bible prophecy. You ever notice that? Yeah. I mean, you can get a lot of times, we have a prophecy conference, you'd probably be able to get some unsaved people here. Yeah. Believe it or not. Uh, so uh, they're, they're curious what the Bible has to say about the future, and even some backslidden Christians. You might be able to get it here. Uh, you, you, get, you have a prophecy conference. He who is finite was created with a desire to seek he who is infinite. You and I are finite. Yeah. All right? We were created with a desire to seek he who is infinite. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they learn to rest in thee. Now, when I say that... Uh, we, we have a desire to seek he who is infinite. I'm not saying that every human being seeks God. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none that understandeth, the Bible says. Amen. But man in his natural, unsaved condition knows that there's something beyond death. Yeah. Now, he might deny it, but he knows in his soul there's something beyond death. They'll even make comments about it. Unsaved people even make comments about it. You know, or, I know where I'm going. I ain't going to heaven. You know, they'll make little stupid comments like that because they're unsaved. They're the natural man. Uh, Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they learn to rest in thee. God made us to be with him in eternity, but man's sin has broken fellowship with God. His sin has caused him to seek satisfaction somewhere else, but to no avail. People are trying to find satisfaction in everything in the old world. But they're not going to take nothing with them. They won't take anything with them. The breach between God and men had to be mended for the fellowship to be restored. Men have their own ideas on how to mend the breach and achieve eternal life, which includes good works or worshiping false gods or other gods. That's what Solomon did. Solomon was right with God when he wrote Proverbs. But when he writes Ecclesiastes, that's later in his life, he departed from God, he committed idolatry. I showed you that in 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11. We see the idolatry on that man, on the part of that man. Yeah. A man who had everything. Yeah. God, however, solved the sin problem and, he, and has made the path to restoration simple. Everlasting life is not something that man achieves or gains by their works. It's a gift that's received by trusting Christ for eternal salvation. Because eternity and a desire for God has been set or planted in our hearts, 
Nothing in this world or in this life, including achievements, awards, accomplishments, are going to quench our restlessness or satisfaction. Now, man might go to all these other things like Solomon does. Man might go to the world and the things of the world to seek satisfaction. Man might go to religion and believe that he's, think that he's all right. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Yeah. Proverbs 14, 12. Proverbs 16, 25. There will be, still be emptiness within the heart. People may find temporary pleasure or satisfaction in things, the things of the world, but the desire for peace in their souls still boils. God planned it that way. We are made with desire that only the Lord can fulfill. We are made with desire that only the Lord can fulfill. And people are trying to fulfill it. There. Now we're not saying it's wrong to have things or to have nice things. We're not saying it's wrong to have money or investments or retirement and all these different things. It's not wrong to do. It's not wrong to plan ahead and things like that. Use your head, use wisdom. It's not wrong. We're not saying that. But what mankind does is man has all these things but leaves God out. Yeah. Yeah. And leaving God out is emptiness. Yeah. It's void. I don't care what you have. I wouldn't trade places with Mark Zuckerberg. And he the head of Facebook. Did he invent Facebook at a young age? The guy is a multi-billionaire. Uh, I wouldn't trade places with, uh, who's the guy out there in Seattle that has the 42,000 square foot house? Bill Gates. All right. I said on the news, him and his wife got a divorce. I don't know. But I, I, I'll tell you this. I don't care. They gave all this money to charity. They told one time how much money they gave to charity. Millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. Think if he would have given that to Bible-believing missionaries. Amen. Yeah. What could be accomplished? Yeah. yeah. I mean, think of that. I mean, you know, charity, that's great, wonderful, but charity usually only deals with the physical yeah. when you give to charity. Now, you can do whatever you want. But I'm just telling you, charitable things, organizations, you don't even know where the money's going half the time some of these organizations. But... That deals with the physical. But we want it. That's why we, we got 10 radio stations. We're on Facebook and YouTube. We're trying to get the word of God out. We don't have hundreds of thousands of people in our church. But we're trying to do what we can do as a church to get the word of God out. Because God said in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, that his word will not return unto me void, he said. Yep. Folks, it's the word of God that's going to do something in people's hearts. Yep. Yep. If things or experiences satisfied us and filled the void in our empty hearts, then we would see no need for God in our lives. The Lord wants us to realize that He is the only one that can fill our need for satisfaction, peace, contentment, happiness, and joy. Some seek for peace by turning to drugs and alcohol, liquor, sinful pleasures, religious deeds, but to no avail. The dread of death hangs over the unsafe sinner because the issue of eternity lingers in his soul. Denying or rejecting life after death and judgment to come will not do any good. Eternity is branded in the heart. You're an eternal soul. If you're saved, well, if you're, uns if you're unsaved, you're going to live somewhere for eternity. And there's only two places, heaven and hell. If you're born again, you'll go to heaven when you die. And you'll go to be of Jesus. And the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 116, 15. We don't look at it like that usually, but he says it's precious. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In Philippians 1, He said, I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 123. Thomas Watson, the Puritan pastor, put it this way. He said, Eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. Eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. Amen. Restlessness in the soul 
will not be calmed until a person puts his or her faith in Jesus Christ. God has already done what he's going to do to save our souls. Now he's got, you know, he'll, he'll convict a sinner and he'll deal with their heart for a while, however long, and show them their need for salvation, but they can receive or reject Christ. When that happens, God gives peace. By being prepared for death, a person is prepared for life uh, each day. Through Christ's salvation, the relationship with God has been healed. Broken fellowship with God caused by sin is restored by faith in the Savior. Faith in Jesus Christ prepares a person for life in eternity. Why wouldn't people want to serve God? God is the one that can come through for you. God is the one that can answer prayer. God is the one that can move mountains. God is the one that can deal in people's hearts and lives and change situations and circumstances. He's the only one that can do it. In fact, it creates a thirst and desire to be with God and fellowship with him face to face. It was David's faith in God that gave him satisfaction as well as a longing for God that he loved dearly. Listen to this. This is what David said, Psalm 63, 1 to 5. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Man, oh man, what a song. C.S. Lewis expressed his longing for God in heaven when he said, quote, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud, Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. The desire and yearning that were in his heart he described as the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. God has put the fragrance of heaven into the heart of mankind so that we will long to be with him. The yearning for heaven will not, however, be quenched or satisfied outside of Jesus Christ. That longing can only be satisfied by a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the A to Z of life. Yep. He's the A to Z of life. Amen. Everything that we need is found in Him. Yep. Look at Ecclesiastes 3.11. So that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Solomon recognized that though he is an eternal being, he could not comprehend adequately all the things of God. And that frustrated him. He yearned to know the purpose and meaning of life and could not discover it. Part of his frustration stemmed from leaving the Lord out of his life. Amen. That brings emptiness. That brings void. And that brings searching for other things and getting involved in other things. If you're a Christian, you want to know the will of God for your life, God will show you what he wants you to know, for he wants you to do his will. We should ask him to show us his will. God has made us where we cannot know the eternal, sovereign plan of God in many matters for this world. You ever something ever happened in your life or you heard about something, you said, God, why did you let that happen? What, what, what earthly good could come of that? I don't know. God is God. There's many things we don't know what he's, uh, what he's planned. He has his reasons for keeping the curtains closed. The scriptures do provide for us events that will take place in the future, but the exact time is still a mystery. Even though God has planted eternity in our hearts, we cannot see the whole picture of God's work from the very beginning to the end of our lives. Those things are for the Lord to know right now. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he says he has, set, he has made everything beautiful 
Uh, in his time also he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. When it's, he says that God set the world in their heart, as I mentioned before, it doesn't mean that God set the world in their heart. He's sitting up in heaven and said, I'm going to set the world in their heart so it'll be harder for them to get saved. They'll just love the world. No, that's part of when the, uh, the Adamic fall, Adam and Eve fell. They, not only are we blinded spiritually, and our eyes are blinded, our mind is blinded, and our heart is darkened and blinded, according to the Bible, but also he has set the world in their heart. That's why a lot of people don't get saved, because they love the world. <laughs> After you get saved, guess what God tells you and I? Love not the world. Be not conformed to this world. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you, Jesus said. The Bible has a lot to say about the world. Let me tell you something. The world doesn't love our Savior, Amen. as a general rule. The world doesn't love this Bible, and the world don't love Bible preaching and teaching. We're blind to many things that are not recorded in His Word. He has kept us ignorant about such matters. Only God knows what He's doing, why He's doing it, when He is going to do it. God accomplishes his purposes in his own time and in his own way, but we will not have full understanding and comprehension of his plan and will until the gates of eternity open up for us, the gates of heaven. And I don't know what all God might tell us up there, reveal to us up there, I don't know. For many of us will not get the answers we're seeking to uh, some of the experiences, trials, testings, and sufferings that we have faced in our lives until we get to heaven. Until that time, we're to trust in him and his care. He'll make things all beautiful in your life. Might not look like it now, but he will. When Jonathan Edwards, the great pastor and theologian, died unexpectedly from a smallpox vaccination, his wife wrote these words. This was back years, many years ago. What shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands on our mouths. The Lord has done it, but my God lives. He has my heart. We are all given to God. Unquote. Mrs. Edwards was yielded to the Lord's will for her life. And then... Ecclesiastes 3.12 I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. 13 And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. There is nothing better for us than to rejoice and do good in our lifetime. Enjoy your life. Enjoy the blessings of God. Solomon has changed his tune a bit from the beginning of this book. We felt that all was vanity. He felt that all was vanity and a waste of time, like chasing the wind, he said in chapter 1, verse 14. He felt that way because he was focused on earthly matters or a life under the sun. The expression under the sun is, is mentioned many times in Ecclesiastes, as we've said before. As he began to acknowledge the Lord, his attitude started to change. He stated here, that the best that a man could do was to be happy, enjoy his labor, and consider it as a gift from the Lord. The king was not encouraging pagan hedonism, but rather the practice of enjoying God's gifts. God's gifts as the fruit of one's labor, no matter how difficult that life may be. Solomon concluded this, meant this was a man's only recourse to life, but it's not. We know that. He felt this was all that life had to offer him and the best he would get in life. This is not the best view man can take in life, but at least Solomon was acknowledging God's blessing. He was showing some signs of spiritual improvement, slowly but surely. He has finally started acknowledging the Lord in, in this message of his. There is more to life than what Solomon was saying here. The best thing that a person can do in our day is, first of all, trust Christ as a Savior, and live, live his or her life in obedience to the Lord and glorify God. Amen. That's it. Tell the gospel to people. Make your life count for the Lord. Count your blessings. Praise and thank the Lord for all that he's done for you and for his many blessings. And follow his guidance and he'll make everything beautiful in his time. In his time. 
the, the problem is, what we think is beautiful, God might not think is beautiful. And what God believes is beautiful, we might not think is beautiful. Verse 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. 15. That which hath been is now. And that which is to be, that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. Verse 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Did God save you? Yeah. It's forever. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You're saved forever. Amen. Solomon provides a biblical mess, a principle that is the foundation for a stable, secure, strong, and serene life. In a nutshell, he said that God is the boss and his word's final. Whatever the Lord does is final and forever. Amen. Nothing can be added or taken away from it for what he does, no matter how hard men try to mess up his creation and his will. God has a blueprint for his creation, as well as your own life. God's work is very thorough. Nothing is missing. He never leaves anything out. Thank God for that. Amen. He's always on time. He thinks of things and does things that we have never thought about or have done because he is God. His work and will are complete no matter how much and how hard men fuss and cuss and complain and mock and blaspheme God. Those who did not believe Noah in Noah's day, the Pharaoh of Egypt who would not listen to Moses, the Egyptian army at the Red Sea, the city of Jericho, the arrogant King Nebuchadnezzar, and the Romans who crucified Jesus, all found out God does what he wants to do. Amen. Aren't you glad you're on his side? Amen. God does what he does to demonstrate his authority and power and control so that men will learn to fear him. This is the point of the whole book of Ecclesiastes. After all that is said and done in this book, Solomon tells us, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. When he was younger and closer to the Lord, Solomon started the book of Proverbs in chapter 1, speaking about the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1, 7. But man, down the road, he got away from that. Where did he learn that? The fear of the Lord. It's very possible that his father David taught him to fear God. David knew all about the power as well as the discipline of God. Notice what David said in Psalms 34, 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The person that fears the Lord has respect for the Lord. He acknowledges and is very aware of God's might and power. Having this attitude toward the Lord puts that person on a path of wisdom and judgment as well as a love for the Lord and obedience to him. The person who does not have this attitude is considered a fool. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1 7. Proverbs, uh, or Psalm, Psalms 110, uh, 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you realize that if God wanted to not stop, this is a sober thought. Stop thinking about this. If God wanted to, God could kill you right now. And me. And there ain't a thing you could do about it. Well, that makes you grateful for every breath, doesn't it? Amen. Every heartbeat. Yeah. What a merciful God. Amen. People who have no reverence or fear of God tend to be arrogant, cocky, and brutal towards others. Fearing the Lord is not going to hurt men, but help them be better men. And that's what people don't, that's, that's what's wrong with America. America don't fear God no more. Amen. There is no fear of God before their eyes, Romans 3.18. Our God is a consuming fire, Amen. Hebrews 12.29. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10.31. And people don't fear him. And then, uh, whatever exists right now has already been in the past, here in verse 14 and 15, Ecclesiastes 3. And whatever will be in the future has already been in the past. You know what the, the old famous saying is? You know, the only thing that men learn from history is that men don't learn from history. Mm -hmm. God will seek to do again what has occurred in the past, verse 15 here says. 
The same causes in the past produce the same results in the present. Violate God's laws and the consequences will be the same no matter what century you live in. His commands do not change. The blueprint for the way he wants us to live is found in his word. Someone said, in the choir of life, it's easy to fake the words, but someday we will all have to sing solo before God. Yep. Boy, that's something to think about. Good. In the choir of life, it's easy to fake the words, but someday we will all have to sing solo before the Lord. Amen. In his book, Searching for Heaven on Earth, David Jeremiah illustrated this truth when he told the story about a man charged with robbery. His name was Garrett. While standing before Judge Armando Rodriguez, the prisoner asked to go to the restroom. The guard escorted him upstairs and guarded the door outside the bathroom. Gary was determined to make his escape. He climbed up the pipes, opened up a ceiling tile, and started crawling through the crawl space. He traveled about 10 yards when the ceiling tiles under him collapsed. He dropped on the floor right back into the courtroom of Judge Armando Rodriguez. <laughs> you can't win, man. You might as well just surrender to the Lord. Amen? People today make this mistaken conclusion that they're going to escape God's judgment only to find they'll end up in God's courtroom and bear the eternal consequences of their sins. Concerning judgment, Dr. Maurice Rawlings put it this way when he said, most people are deathly afraid of dying. They say, doctor, I'm afraid of dying. But he said, I've never heard one of them say, doctor, I'm afraid of judgment. That should be the concern of every person. Daniel Webster, I've mentioned you to you several times this, Daniel Webster was a statesman. He was asked about his greatest fear, what is the most sobering thought that's ever entered across his mind. And he said, my greatest thought, my greatest thought and the most sobering thought that's ever entered into my mind is my personal accountability to God. Alan Redpath said, Quote, certainly when the truth of judgment begins to burn in a man's conscience, there is not a day that he lives when that day is not related to the day of judgment. Look here at uh, ver chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 16 and 17, and moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. Verse 17, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time there for every purpose and uh, for every work. No matter where Solomon turned, there was wickedness. Whether it was in a courtroom, the place of judgment, or in a place of righteousness, like the Jewish temple, there was wickedness. Our depravity knows no boundaries. The king rightly concluded that the Lord will judge the wicked as well as the righteous. I mean, God sees everything. Imagine a being that can see everything and everybody and knows every thought of every human being in the world. Like I've said many times, my vision is limited. I mean, I, here in this sanctuary, I can't even see everybody in the entire sanctuary. If I look over this way, I can't really see what's going on over here that well. I mean, I can see... I, you know, and I, if I look over here, I can't really see over here. We're limited in our vision. God can look down and see seven and a half billion people on the earth. What a God. Amen. Neither is there any creature that has not manifested his sight. Each year, the Super Bowl gets more coverage than any other single sporting event. And that's going on right now as I speak. The six hours devoted to pregame and the game itself makes it a network's biggest production of the year. And they build that thing up for two weeks, man. Somebody, I heard the other day, I think a 30-second commercial during the Super Bowl, 30 seconds. 
cost seven million. A 30 second 30 seconds cost seven million. 30 seconds. Boom. 30 seconds later, boom, seven million. They're good. You say corporations and companies pay that? Oh yeah, honey. And more. Some of them get 60 second commercials. That's probably 10 or 12 million. The six hours devoted to pregame and the game itself makes it a network's uh, biggest production of the year. NFL Films, the league's official film and TV company, uses about this is this is probably the you know a few years ago, five, ten years ago, might be more now, but they use about 150 cinematographers, producers, and technicians for this one game. I mean, it's, it's shown all over the world. Their whole entourage includes nearly 40 trailers and trucks. They use 28 cameras and shoot about 25 miles of film. Yet with all this coverage, not everything is filmed. Even though almost every angle is covered, some shots will be missed. See, why do you say that, preacher? When we stand before the Lord in judgment, nothing will be missed. Yeah. The NFL Films and the league's official film and TV company ain't nothing, honey, compared to God's setup, what he's got. Yeah. Matthew 12, 36 tells us we must give an account for every idle word. Although the Super Bowl coverage seems impressive, it's nothing more than a blurry snapshot when compared to God's chronicles of our lives. Paul said in Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the judgment seat. That context is the judgment seat for Christians. Didn't talk about unsaved people there. Ecclesiastes 3, 18. I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them that they might see that they themselves are beasts. 19, for that which befalls the sons of men befalls beasts. Every one, even one thing befalls them. As the one dies, so dieth the other. In other words, beast and human beings, we all die. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man have no preeminent hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. For that is his portion, for who shall bring for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? The Lord watches what men and women do today. The Lord, the word manifest in verse 18 means to test, to prove, to sift, or winnow. Even now the Lord is testing or sifting mankind, revealing the character and nature of men. Now a beast, when a beast dies, they're not eternal souls. Sorry to tell you, but when your dog or cat dies, they didn't go to heaven. Yeah. Jesus didn't die for cats and dogs. Yeah. He didn't die for skunks or cows or rats. All right? He died for eternal soul. Man is an eternal soul. Yeah. You're an eternal soul. And your spirit goes upward. The spirit of the beast goes downward. You see that dead deer on the side of the road? All the other little creatures are feasting on it having a buffet dinner. <laughs> when that deer died, it died. That was it. You see a dead dog or cat in the road, as soon as it expired, died, it was done. It no longer existed. It doesn't have an eternal soul. When people reject God and shut him out of their lives, they have a tendency to behave like beasts. The slaughter of a million babies in abortion clinics each year in this country and the applause of politicians about this slaughter shows just how barbaric, bloodthirsty, and beast-like our nation has become. We have become so barbaric that when the coronavirus pandemic shut down most businesses and churches in America in the past two years, the abortion clinics remained open because they were considered essential businesses. Now that's the condition of our country. 
Judgment, however, is coming. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Judgment is coming. <clears throat> something else on that. Let me get something here. Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and uh, chapter 3 and verse uh, let's see here, chapter 3 uh, verse 15 and that which is to be hath already been if you want to study America right now, then study the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, or the Aaron's teaching there, 1st uh, Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. And you'll see what's going to be for America. That which is to be hath already been, here in Ecclesiastes 3.15. 3.16, And moreover I saw unto the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. So judgment is a place of righteousness and a place of wickedness. And when Christ judges the world, he judges the world in righteousness. In other words, when the Lord judges the world, he's going to judge him, judge him by Jesus Christ. Because Acts 17, 29 says, In the times this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Jesus Christ. By that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. That man, Jesus, he hath raised him from the dead. Yeah. Acts 17, 29 to 31. Chapter 3, verse 18, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. This is the principle of naturalism which is the principle uh, that actions and thoughts are based upon natural desires or instincts. Verse 19, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. That's a naturalistic way of looking at things. If you don't know anything about the New Testament, that's the way you'd look at it. Every evolutionist in the world looks at man the way verse 18 and 19 says. All right, that's a naturalistic way. All right, but uh, a man hath no preeminence above a beast. Well, a man does have a preeminence. He's looking at things under the sun. He's looking at it like, well, man dies and beast dies. All right, verse 20. All go into one place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. Uh, there used to be a group before I got saved. I listened to them. Sorry to say. Kansas. They had a song, All We Are is Dust in the Wind. Well, that's true. But I'm glad that God uses us dust. Amen. Amen. God blesses us dust. Amen. 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 Yep. Just dust. That's where he made that. Dust of the ground. Yeah. Brother Jimmy Hood used to say, All we are is an animated dirt ball. <laughs> animated dirt ball he had thousands that went to his church too amen he was so positive amen brother Jimmy just kidding uh, this is pantheism in verse 20 everything is the same all that's all the creation is connected with one unit what, what he's saying is and this is what a lot of people think and believe a naturalistic unsaved unregenerated heart looks at it if man is dead like a dog, these last two or three verses, don't worry about it. Why would you kill a man for killing a dog? Do we kill? Now, I know recently, in the last few years, they got all these laws now that if you, you know, if you if you're show, uh, if you're mean to animals or something, they can get you for animal cruelty and things like that. But years ago, they didn't have anything like that. Somebody killed a dog, he just killed a dog. Well, why would you kill a man for killing a dog? So why would you kill a man for killing another man if a beast and a man are the same? See, that's why I would say people look at it. They go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 18, 19, and 20, and uh, verse 19, especially for that which befall the sons of men, befall the beasts. Even one thing befall them. As one dies, so die the other. We're just like a beast. We all die. So 
I'm not saying I believe this, but I'm saying this is a naturalistic way of looking at it. Under the sun, people that don't know anything about New Testament biblical Christianity or the Word of God. That's why they're do that's what they're doing uh, away with capital punishment in America, most states, is because of the idea of evolution. If a man is just another part of the evolutionary chain of planets, of plants and animals, why would you kill a man for killing another man? Nobody worries about it when somebody runs over a cat or a dog in the road or a rabbit. That comes from a Darwinian ideology and philosophy of life. But man is better than a beast. And man is above a beast. All right, God don't use animals. God uses man. Amen. And animals don't glorify God in that sense, technically. God, man, man is supposed to get saved and serve his creator. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Uh, look at chapter 12. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. I believe I showed you this verse. But Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse uh, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was found, or as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So, you and I, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So your spirit returns unto God, your soul you get saved, your soul is saved, your spirit is regenerated, and nothing happens to your flesh when you got saved. You still have the same old flesh that you had when you got saved. This flesh goes back to the dust. Yeah. I put you in a casket, bury you six feet in the ground, and you'll rot. But your soul left your body at the time of death. Yeah. If you were saved... Born again, you went to heaven. If you were not saved, born again, you went down to hell. Forever. Uh, 20, Ecclesiastes 3, 22, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? In other words, God shows us future things. And... Uh, he shows us things uh, in the future, and uh, John, John 16, 13, uh, he talks about the Spirit that will uh, show you things. John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Show you things to come. And then in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them but loving. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10 and 11. Verse 9, 10 and 11. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes, uh, oh, uh, I've never met any human being who had eternity placed in his heart until the Holy Spirit began to convict him of his sin and got he got worried about life after death. The world is so set in the heart of every human being that upon conversion, a believer is commanded to get out of it. In the sense of, you know, we're, I know we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world, 1 John 2, 15. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, James 4, 4. The Bible talks about worldly lust. All right, Chris, uh, Ephesians, or, uh, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1. So I returned and considered all the, th all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, they had no comfort. You realize how many people have been oppressed in this country or around the world in the last few centuries? Uh, I mean, you can go through and read church history 
You see how the Jews were oppressed in the 1940s by Hitler? You see how different people in communistic countries have been oppressed? I mean, we could go on all night long about this. I read some material there the other day about it, and I thought, I'll bring this up. Oh, man, it's, I mean, it goes on and on about all this oppression in the past few centuries, since the time of Christ. I mean, Christians were burned at the stake in the 1500s. John Huss, Savonarola were burned at the stake. Martin Luther, that's when he came out of the Catholic Church. I've said this to you a million times. And started the Lutheran Church. 1500. He got light on the fact we had Tom Castellaw here. Tom Castellaw was a missionary to Germany for years. He showed us up here the picture of the church that uh, uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis on the door of a, a Catholic church in Wittenberg, Germany. You know what 95 thesis is? He, he found 95 things wrong with the Catholic church. That's hate literature! <laughs> When's the last time you heard a preacher on the radio and television say that? <laughs> never! Never, never, never. Uh, that's what's wrong with our country. Preachers are afraid to preach and tell the truth. Amen. So Martin Luther started the Lutheran Church. John Wesley and his brother Charles started the Wesleyan Methodist Church in the 1700s. Those churches aren't what they used to be, but a lot of Baptist churches aren't what they used to be. Amen. A lot of churches aren't what they used to be. A lot of churches don't even exist anymore. Amen. Don't get me started on that. But here in Ecclesiastes 4, 1, So I return and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of such as were oppressed, and the tears of such as were oppressed. You realize how many tears have been shed? I told you this before, I'll tell you again. You can Google it. It's called Tolerance Museum in downtown Los, Los Angeles. Downtown Los Angeles. Tolerance Museum. I went there a few years ago, a couple preachers. Brother Kim out there in L.A., another preacher, Brother Cronin. We went in there, we was in there several hours. You wouldn't believe the things those Jewish people went through. And some woman out there who was at, this was like five, six, seven years ago, we went, she was in her 80s. She might be dead by now. She showed us the number that Hitler put on them. They were just a number. Showed us the number that was on her arm. Put on her arm. Still had it on her. From the 1940s. You realize that stuff just happened 75 years ago. 80 years ago. In our world, that stuff happened. They showed them. They'd haul them off. Truckloads. Men and women. To the concentration camps. Just because they were Jewish. You talk about oppression. When those Jews said, and his blood be upon us and our children there in the Gospels, Hitler said, Amen. It's part of, part of judgment. Uh, you think Hitler ain't burning in the lowest hell? He'll never get out. And this lady told about how that you when you got up to the one of his she told the name of the guy, it's one of his right hand men, Hitler's right hand men. Not Himmler, I don't think Himmler, but somebody else. But you got up there, and she was just a teenage girl, 13 years old. And she said, when you got up there, she said, I tried to spruce myself up and make myself look a little older and look like I could be a good worker. So I was just a frail little girl. And because when you got up to that man, that man, that guy would look at you, and if he said that way, you got on the trucks and to, you went to your death. If he said that way, you went to the work camps. And they wouldn't put you to death. And that little girl got up there and he went, the work camp. She talked for 50 minutes. I was crying. I had tears running down my face. This little feeble Jewish lady sitting there in this big, great big room. All these people sitting there and she spoke with a microphone for 50 minutes. And I'm telling you, I wanted to witness to her, but they had police there and everything. I mean, it's, it's down, in the, down near the downtown Los Angeles area. It's, I mean, it's guarded heavily outside, security and stuff. 
And, uh, but I wanted to witness to her so bad. We went up and talked to her. She got out of there and her, she met her husband, he's a Jewish man. He ended up being a doctor or something. They had about five or six kids. I think all their kids were doctors and lawyers. And she told her story. It was absolutely unbelievable. And I sat there and I just thought, I'm a wimp. I am a wimp. What that woman went through. Unbelievable. Uh, but verse 1, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. Well, there's been a lot of tears in this old world since Adam and Eve, folks. I'm going to tell you. Some of you have shed some tears. A lot of tears. And they had no comforter. But thank God Christians have a comforter. Amen. Woo! we got to shout and run the aisle. You read church history. I told you before, I've got a, I've got, it's like a, it's like a magazine. It's not a magazine, it's like a pamphlet with pages. It's got all the presidents. In it. All the presidents. And it's got a whole page of like a little, like several paragraphs of what the president went through. Like a sketch of, of their life. Of all the presidents since George Washington. You would not believe some of the things that some of our presidents went through before they were president, during their presidency, and afterwards. I'm telling you, since the 1700s, it is unbelievable. A bunch of them lost kids, lost children to death in different ways. I mean, tuberculosis and all, you know, they didn't have all the cures and medicine we got today for all this stuff. A bunch of them. Abraham Lincoln, probably president during the hardest time of our country, and lost a son during, before he became president, while he was president, and then he got shot in the Ford Theater. This is what his wife went through. And one of the boys died after, they gave their names there, and and one of the boys died after he was shot and killed. So his wife went through three, the death of three of her sons. I think they had four sons. Three of the sons and her husband. I forget her name. She's a little short for me. Mary Todd Lincoln. Shows a picture of her. I mean, these people went through it, man. Christians have a comforter. John 14, 15, and 16 talks about the comforter, the Holy Spirit. I'm glad we have a comforter. Yes. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 6 talks about the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them who are going through tribulations and trials, he talks about. See, God will comfort you in your times of tribulation so you can be a comfort to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what, we live in a day and time there's, there's a lot of people, they need comfort. People are going through a lot of things. The last two years especially, people are going through a lot of stuff. A minute and a half. Uh, the power to oppress is fascism. A strong dictatorship, fascism is a strong dictatorship, nationalistic ideology. That's the way our country's headed right now. Because of the leadership in our country. They glorify war. Mussolini, Hitler were fascists. Many of the communists are fascists in their ideology. Millions and millions of people have been oppressed in the inquisitions, the concentration camps, and the furnaces of Germany. The communists have oppressed and annihilated millions and oppressed millions with their dictatorship. That's something the stinking, rotten, low-down, left-wing news media don't want you to know. They want you to think this country would be great, wonderful, if it became fascism and socialistic and communistic. That's a lie out of pits of hell. Yeah. Lie out of pits of hell. Verse 2, I'll close with this. Ecclesiastes 
Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Sometimes people would rather be dead than alive. It gets that way in the tribulation. They'll seek for death but can't find it. Yeah. Revelation 9, 6. Verse 2 is a statement on paganism. A worship of the dead. Verse 2 is also connected with Confucianism, which involves honoring the dead and ancestor veneration. Close with that.